that's it. Yes. Okay, awesome. So thanks, Mike, very much for the introduction. Uh, he's right. Some of you, so my name is Martin Konicek. Some of you might remember me from the core React Native team at Facebook. Since then, I quit Facebook to take the summer off. And I'm doing nothing. I'm just kite surfing. And I have a YouTube channel about kite surfing now, so we, you, can, you can check that out. <laughs> but of course, of course, I love uh, programming. I love React Native. Uh, so that's why I'm at this conference. And after the summer, I'm going to work again. So uh, this, this talk is uh, sort of a story about how I tried building a feature in the, in the Facebook app. So I'll give you a very quick overview of what React Native is. I think that will be very obvious for most of you. And then I'll actually talk about what I built with it and what I found interesting about building something with React Native inside the Facebook app. So it was, the, the story goes that it was, uh, I think it was 2015 and I was working on some different pro project at Facebook and then I saw this prototype. Some, some very smart engineers at the London office were building uh, this thing called React Native, and I didn't really know it, know what it was, but I, I checked it out, and I saw that you can, like, you can build UI in JavaScript super easily, and you can you can reload your app, and you don't have to wait for compilation. So then, basically, this was enough to uh, convince me to join that React Native team, because I thought it was like such a such a good experience. You might know that under the hood. The way this works, if you if you change one line of uh, of JavaScript code, this will basically go to the React Native Packager, and yeah, and it will rebuild the whole JavaScript bundle for your app, and the app will just restart and run again. Uh, after a while, I even realized that the APIs uh, in JavaScript look the same on both platforms, so I didn't have to learn special APIs for saving something to disk. Uh, with, uh, yeah, on iOS or on Android, so then I like the framework even more. Afterwards, uh, there was this great community effort uh, around third-party libraries, and actually this was possible thanks to Mike and Alex Kurif, who built this React Native Link command that lets you link third-party native code into your library, so that's when I felt like the project really took off. Awesome. So, uh, yeah. So this is how you can add a map to your to your app, for example, and it's it's pretty. I found it pr pretty easy. And there is this whole repository of uh, of popular libraries. I'm sure, like most of you, already know about this. So that was like a very quick overview of of what React Native is. So now let's talk a bit about what I built with it and why. So before Facebook and at Facebook, I always worked on developer tools. For like few years, I always built like IDEs and, and frameworks. And I actually kind of forgot what it's like to build an app. And I thought, hey, this is a bit silly. Like I'm, uh, I'm building this framework and, I, and all these engineers at Facebook, there are like, you know, dozens of engineers by the time using it. Um, and I don't really know like what their pain points are. Are they getting stuck or something? And what, it, what is it like, actually, like the end-to-end -end experience building something? So I wanted to know. And there was this team. Uh, there was this team at Facebook that had this old feature. And I should explain first what that feature does. So let me show, let, let me explain it a bit because it's a bit complicated. So basically to see this feature in the Facebook app, you have to be an advertiser. So if you ever like spend five, uh, five euro to boost a post in the Facebook app, you're an advertiser. And then there's this specialized team that uh, makes it easier for you to create ads. So what you get in the Facebook app is this notification at the top that says, hey, you advertised something in the past, and that performed pretty well. That, that was good, like people clicked on that. So why don't you go and create a new ad? And yeah, so basically try to like, help you create more ads, but also it's good for Facebook, right? Because people, uh, people spend more money. So that, that's good. And they already had this uh, thing built. Uh, so this was a team in London, they had this thing built. But you can see that if I click this uh, notification in the Facebook app, and I'm on Wi-Fi, 
takes like forever to show the screen. And what this screen is, like it shows you, yeah, so you can boost these posts. These are some posts you could, you could boost and go ahead and, and try it. Uh, but it's a web view, so it, it, was, uh, it just fetched the mobile Facebook website with HTML, loads a lot of JavaScript, and renders this. And it was super slow. Uh, and also, it didn't really look like the rest of the app, right? Because it's not native UI. So then you can tap a post, and you can boost it here. So that's, that's pretty simple. But OK, so the idea the team had is like, let's try to rebuild this, and it, maybe it will be a better user experience. So the designer on that team create, created this, which looked like the actual native UI of the Facebook app. And then the team was looking for someone to build this. I met up with the team, and at Facebook you can change teams very easily. There is this thing called uh, Hack a Month, uh, where you can go and work on a different team for a month and see if you like it. If you don't, you just go back to your old team. So I went back. I went to the team and I said, OK, I will build this for you, uh, but can I use React Native? And the manager was fine. But, uh, she just said, yes, you can use React Native. So cool. So th this was my goal to basically rebuild this UI. Uh, in yeah, with native UI. So this is what it looked like. This is what the first version looked like. And look at the speed. If you tap it, you can now see the UI appears quickly. It was actually quicker quicker than I expected. Um, this is on Wi-Fi, so it won't be as fast in real world. But like this actually fetched some data and rendered it with React Native. So I was like, why was the HTML version so slow? I didn't really know. Uh, cool. So I built that. Uh, it didn't. It didn't take very long. I built that on iOS first. Then I tried running the code on Android in the Facebook app. It didn't take much effort, and it ran as well. And you can see here that, yeah, some of the, some of the UI looks like pretty similar, but there are small differences. Like the fonts are different, right? The the boost post button looks different. So how is this actually achieved? Because it's the same JavaScript code. So it's the same thing as most of you would probably come up with. There are just some constants that are actually something like a font helper or color helper. So basically, give me some standard colors or fonts used across the whole Facebook code base. This way, uh, the app looks consistent, and engineers don't have to think about it too much if I just want, like, what, what are the design guidelines for fonts? I just use this constant. And it will give me the right value on Android and iOS, right? So if I just, for example, have some button helper, or it's just called button, it will give me something that looks like an iOS button or Android button. How does that work? You probably know this as well. Uh, there is the, yeah, there is the React Native Packager, and on different platform, you just request, you, you just ask it to build, build the JavaScript bundle, sorry, the iOS bundle or the Android bundle, and it returns you the right thing. So in your code, you just say font helper, uh, font helper dot primary text, and the packager just returns you a different code for the font helper, basically. OK, so that's the theory. Let's talk about some code, actually, how this was built. Um, so first of all, I had to like I had to figure out how to build this thing. So first of all, I went and looked at how do the notifications work in this in the Facebook app. It's not actually related to React Native, but I found that a pretty interesting and elegant concept. So I'll explain it very quickly. So in the Facebook app, every notification has some kind of string, just a URL uh, that you can define on the server side. And the URL that was, that was basically bundled inside this notification was just a web, web URL. Uh, so I just replaced that on the server side with this app-specific URL, right? And then I just, in, the app has like a routing mechanism where you just define, OK, so if the URL is boost post picker, I will render this React Native component because the Facebook app just has all this routing mechanism built in, and it has support for React Native routes. Uh, cool. So I, I returned this uh, React Native component. 
And it's just a standard React component, like it has some state. It's using flow. Um, and yeah, just the standard stuff like you, like you would use on the web even. Inside it is a GraphQL query, of course, because Facebook uses GraphQL for all data fetching, and the GraphQL was kind of invented for the Facebook app. Um, so yeah, now you d not only have uh, styles inside your JavaScript code, but you even have a query inside your JavaScript code. So everything is in one file. And the library used for this is, is Relay, uh, of course. And yeah, basically just define, define the query. I want the page name. I want some boost post suggestions. And on each, of the, on each post, I want number of likes and the image, for example. Now, how do, how do I see that this query actually works? There is this tool called Graphical. Uh, which is just a web tool where I can paste my query and run it, uh, run it live with code completion like this in the browser. This was actually pretty nice because I was also adding some, um, yeah, I was adding some new fields on the server side in PHP. So basically, there is like an API to extend the data model. Of course, it's not fixed, right? Page has like a name, but if you want to add more stuff to page, you can you can just do it. And then you can test it like this in the browser. It just iterates very quickly. So that was very useful. Then you just get back the data. Um, yeah. Then you just run it, get back the data in the browser. You iterate on the query. If you see, if you see that you're happy with that query, uh, you can go ahead and, and start using it in your app. Then actually, I was almost done, right? Uh, I just define what data I need. Uh, for and relay gives me the data. Then I just render the data like this. Um, so, for example, yeah, I def I define that I want to have a post, and the post has image URI that gets fetched by relay, and also post has a message snippet. So I was actually a bit surprised that this was like almost too simple. I was like, wait, so I just wrote like some query, and now I just render the results, and that that's it. Didn't have to. Uh, take care of almost anything, thing, basically. Really made it very easy. Cool. Uh, then another thing I kind of discovered when I was building this is, hey, we have this flow support in Nuclide. So when I type, there was actually a good job, I think, by the, by the Nuclide team. So you get code completion. And if you make typos, you will yeah, you will get like underline errors, and it tells you where the it er tells you where the error is, or if you hover over something, it will take tell you that it's a that it's a boolean. So it's almost like writing Java, but don't have to wait for compilation. Uh, cool. I don't know if that's a good thing. I actually like Java, but uh, I think I, at this conference I I shouldn't say it. <laughs> okay. Cool. Uh, then styles and layout, of course, is the last thing. Uh, so yeah, uh, you, you want this? You want like a header that has a recommended posts and and this little question mark on the right side, and you just say space between, and it's done, and it works on both platforms. So that's what I liked. Now the question is actually, you saw from the designer, I had just like a picture, right? I, I just had a PNG file showing me what what the UI should look like. How do I turn this into this design? Or I mean, how do I turn it into, into code? So I have this, right? And the designer like, doesn't care about, about what is Flexbox or React Native. And, or she cares, but like, yeah. Uh, basically, may, maybe just doesn't know. Uh, so yeah, so how do I turn this into code? So the designer uses Sketch. So I don't actually just get an image, but I get, how many of you use Sketch? OK, yeah, it's like super popular. Uh, so there's this thing where it shows you like how far different elements are from each other. So that's super helpful when like setting up your style. But actually at Facebook, we also had this like, we had this Sketch plugin, which where the designer would use standard elements. And then me as, a, as an engineer, I would like, click on this button and see that like it's color palette dot primary button. So basically Sketch had like support for React Native. 
Uh, I think in a, outside of Facebook, there's like this tool called Zeppelin, but I don't know if, if it has support uh, for React Native yet. Or, yeah, it does. Oh, that's awesome, okay, cool. Uh, so basically, this, ma this made it like quite easy to turn that into code. And, but what, what did the designer not, not tell me? So I had this, and what do you think were the things where I got stuck, basically, I was missing some information? Any ideas? So I wanted to build this whole UI, and like, I only had this. Okay, well, what, for example, should the button have any animation when I click on it? It's static, so I can't really tell. So here, when I want to open this thing, this thing at the top, it actually opens, and the button at the bottom as well. Like, how should they, what should the interactions look like, right? And for specifying that, there's this thing called Origami Studio. I'm sure there are like, there's like other, other tools where basically a designer can create a mock like this, where you can also see, see the animations. But what I did, I just went back to the designer and I was like, how should this animate? And she just told me. Uh, I guess it's like normal, you need to have like a conversation with your designer. Uh, which is also something I discovered. Okay, cool. So. Now it's actually the, like, this, is, this was actually the most interesting part for me. Well, the building the product was pretty interesting because my actual, like, secret goal when going to this team for building, at, like, advertisement fe advertising features was I actually wanted to see, like, where React Native sucks and then I can go back to the React Native team and Im improve React Native. And by building this in Nuclide and, uh, I, and with GraphQL, I actually discovered a few things that were like pretty bad. They were, most of them were like specific to actually the engineering at Facebook. Like there are some processes competing for, for CPU and memory and, and basically all the people using React Native, they're like, see, like their laptop would be just hot all the time and stuff like this. But this was like Facebook specific, but then I realized this and then we went back and fixed that, so that was already useful. Um, and then the shipping was interesting for me as well, because you write this code, but how do you actually get it on people's phones? Um, so what, what could we do? We could commit it to the code base and now we ship it in the next release and now everybody will have it on their phones. But what if that feature is actually worse. Like, remember we used to have an old design with, with a web view, and we used, now we build something new and we ship it, and what if actually people don't like it? How do we know? So the answer is of course A-B testing, which Facebook do, does like for every little code change pretty much. So there's this like little guideline I got for, from people on the ads team uh, that, was, that I found pretty interesting. So this is how they usually rolled out the code. Um, it can be specific to a team, but commit it to the code base and roll it out to employees. So all Facebook employees, which is quite a lot of people, uh, will start seeing your, your new code that you, that you just wrote and committed on their phone. So that's awesome. Uh, basically, why we are doing this is if it crashes or if Facebook employees start complaining, you get feedback and you know that you shouldn't ship it to production. If everything is good, you open it to 5%. So 5% or it could be 1%, depends on your use case. So 5% people uh, in the world start seeing like this new screen that you built, but everyone else still sees the old screen. And then again, you see like, is it crashing in some weird scenarios? Maybe I didn't think about some edge case. But also you start looking at some product metrics, which I will explain later. So, metrics. What kind of metrics do you think uh, we should be looking at? Sales. Sorry? Sales. Sales, okay. Conversions? Yeah, I think someone said conversions as well. So yeah, actually, are people boosting the posts with this feature? Like, are they creating more ads or less ads, right? And this, could, this will be specific to like what you're trying to achieve. If everything is okay, open to 50%, wait a bit more. If everything is fine, then finally you can open to 100%. And you either declare that this feature 
was a failure and has to be redesigned, or it was good, and you just leave it in the code base, and you can delete the old one. So how does this A-B testing work? Uh, so there's this very cool system uh, at Facebook. It's like a server-side rule engine. And basically, in the Facebook apps, both on Android and iOS, there are like a lot of Boolean flags. Like, is this feature enabled? Is this feature enabled? And they are all like, it's just like a huge list of, of true or false. But the way you define these is, is basically on the server side. So you say, I, you create like a new flag called new post picker. And you define just on the server side, it's open to 100% employees. And now the app will start returning true only if you're an employee. It, was, it will return false if you are not an employee. And based on that, in your code, you can do something different, right? Uh, then you go, and if, if, it's okay, if, if you don't have like, uh, crazy crashes from employees, say I open it to 20% public. So I basically define 20% on the server side. It's just like a web-based tool. And if, if I see something goes horribly wrong, for example, I can bump it down to, to zero. So I disable that feature without having to push any code or anything. So you can immediately like, disable and enable features in the app like this. Cool. So then I go and say, mm, yeah, then I, I say 50%. So it's like this, 20% people will pass this flag. It will return true. But then, for the purpose of the A-B test, uh, I split the people into two groups of the same size. So one is called control group, one is called test group. And the control group will still see the old features, but it will be collecting data. The test group will see the new feature. So the way it works, like 20% of all people pass this flag, this gatekeeper. 50% uh, of them see the old UI, 50% of them see the new UI. So in the end, like 10% of everyone in the world is like seeing this, seeing this new screen. Cool. Um, so what is, the, what is the purpose of this? Like we already talked about this, but you want to collect some metrics, right? So A-B test uh, is there, so you can actually see if this feature is performing well. Uh, and you, you see stuff like this. You have a tool which basically shows you the results. And there is, there is a product metric, like the sales you mentioned. In this case, it would be, for example, called boost post. There is another feature called enter editor. So do people actually choose a post in the first place? And if they do, do are they going to boost it? And then there are some other metrics. And now, why are these, some of these are like gray and some of these are blue? So Basically, these things are, it's statistics, right? You are collecting measurements from many different devices, and you only have some statistical confidence, like that you have this, like, 95%, in, with 95% co confidence, you moved this metric within this interval. And that's, like, the darkest part. It's the 90, 95%. But then you have, with 90, 99% confidence, it's actually in this interval, which is a little bit bigger. So you're like not completely sure where it is. But you can look at the blue metrics, which say like, okay, we've collected enough measurements where the mean is the red line, it's here, and we have, let's say, 99% confidence that it actually moves the metric over like to the right. It's, the metric is now higher than it used to be. So, you're comparing like the results from the people in the control group and the test group. Mm. Yeah. So basically, what I what I wanted to see here is that like the boost post moves to the blue and to the right, which it didn't. And now, like, what do you do? So you build some UI. You think it's actually better than it used to be, but it's not. Uh, so what do you do? Go back, go back, try something. try something else, yes. So actually the lesson I learned here is like, uh, we rebuilt this from WebView to React Native, which actually there were some crashes which I thought could affect this metric, but then I fixed those crashes, so that should be fine. 
but also the UI changed a lot from what it used to look like, and it had like more information inside it. So I wasn't sure, like, is this inf information, like, new info, actually confusing, or what's going on? So I ended up going back, and actually, um, you can see it here. This is the this is the old design, and this is the new design. And yeah, I so there, it's like a huge change. And I wasn't like it was moving a bit to the right, but it wasn't like statistically significant. So I actually ended up going back and changing that UI to look more like the old UI, but built with React Native. Um, so basically, do a step at a time. Don't do like that was a big lesson that I learned. Like, don't change a lot of stuff at the same time. Like, and actually, then later I realized that other teams at Facebook learned the same lesson. So, but it's fine. So. Uh, yeah, basically don't like do crazy redesigns, just like change a little bit, measure, and then change the next thing, measure, maybe then try adding like this little thing about reach up to 1,000 people and measure again. So in like the summary, what I learned and also about estimating, so my estimate was like way off. You would think, like I was like, yeah, this, uh, this is gonna take like three weeks, right? So, uh, yeah, it was an interesting experience. Of course, like engineers never estimate correctly, but error handling. So think about like, oh, I'm gonna have errors in production, and I actually can't repro them locally. Like I had, I have a crash, and I, I like, I'm not sure why it's crashing, so I have to like try and repro and and, and repro it in production, uh, which happened, and I fixed it. Uh, then, like, you have to chat with the designer. Maybe they are like in a different time zone, so account for that as well. And yeah, you have to iterate. Like, you think that it's finished, and then you realize, like, oh, metrics actually say that it's not finished. So actually, I yeah, like writing the code is like the small, small part of the of the whole process. Uh, cool. Okay. So that's it. Thank you very much. And <laughs> Yeah, you can ask me some questions if you have any questions, or ask me on Twitter. It's uh, it's fine. Yeah, we can do uh, we can do questions during the break. So okay. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much.